Welcome back to CVM Live. It's now time for the major stories in detail. And we begin with a CVM Live investigative story. More controversy surfaces with fresh information on the ownership and occupancy of a beach allegedly owned by the Discovery Bay Beach Club Limited. We spoke to a member of the Discovery Bay Beach Club Limited who sought to put a fresh perspective on the table. Our reporter Nika Lewis investigates. After weeks of follow-ups and investigations, CVM Live in an interview with Mark McConnell, one of the 50 club members of the Discovery Bay Beach Club Limited, opted to shed light on the row between an alleged leasee with whom they were in court for over a year in relation to a beach in Discovery Bay, St. Anne. Speaking off-camera, the St. Anne resident detailed the alleged chronology of events that led to a massive court dispute and a number of heated exchanges. McConnell, who grew up in Discovery Bay, presented a number of court documents concerning the beach where some seniors were reported lost as participating in aqua aerobic sessions under the woman McConnell said was only a leasey. In his version of the story, the Discovery Bay Beach Club Limited, which he says is the only such club limited registered and legally operating in the island, founded in the 1950s, are the owners of the property. He said the civilian leased the property for two years from April 1, 2014 to March 2016 from the Discovery Bay Beach Club Limited, to whom monthly rental was being paid. He said after a series of complaints concerning the leasee renting out to parties that constantly affected the neighborhood, a letter was sent to her advising on January 13, 2016, of an intention to not renew the lease. This letter, he advised, was sent from their lawyer. Upon receiving this, he said, the leasee became abrasive and stopped paying rent, despite occupying the premises for months after that. That's when he said, upon the directives of the police and realizing that the alleged leasee was not willing to vacate the property, they decided to settle the matter in court. More documents in hand and refusing to be caught on camera, McConnell explained they spent just over one and a half years before the courts in a bid to prove ownership, which had become a contention and also seeking to evict the leasee. In the end, he said the court ruled in their favor and asked that the leasee vacate the property, which she allegedly failed to do. Hence, he said the court brought in a team to demolish the property. On the matter of the debris being left on the leasee's private property, he said the group had nothing to do with that, as everything was handled by the court after the court reportedly found the leasee in contempt of court orders. He said the property is being renovated to allow for greater access to the public without any leasee in the future. Nika Lewis, CVM Live. 24-year-old Ramon Hall drowned at the Sugarman's Beach in Portmore on Ash Wednesday after taking one final swim. Yesterday, his mother cried for closure as she says they have not been given sufficient assistance in locating his body. For that follow-up story, here's CVM Live's Khadija Thomas. The family of Ramon Hall is calling for greater accountability from the owners of Sugarman's Beach, who they blame for not doing enough. However, the owner of Sugarman's Beach, George Smith, blames the family. But him shouldn't be drowned that way, he's them cast it too. Though not dispelling the rumors that other persons have drowned at the beach in the past, he says the family sought help from him, but they could not locate Ramon Hall. I was there with my lifeguard, belt and things, a four of us sit down there. We try and ask him, because when, when the guys meme come to you, know, I'm say, where him drown? Where him drown? Just show me where him drown. And him, Gosso and Emma Gosso, we can't get no direct red sense. Cause everybody there say something wrong. Cause how him fi just drown right there, so we so much away there. And him can't show away where him drown. Cause me ready. I ah, know. He can't show away. Man, man go look people over there at the beach. Cause it's one long strip of beach go fi come. Search for them. I'm saying a little time you take for go go search. If one was joining him now, that John already. He says he was told that Ramon had not emerged from the water, but there were clear signs that a lifeguard was not available. Boy, I mean, I know if he's saying or something funny. Because all oh, that little boy John with sorry for him still. But what we're saying is that we don't get any chance to do anything for him. Come and show him father and say, see, there we don't keep. When I'm a lifeguard, I know government tell me don't fence up the beach. I say fence up the beach and send it off and make them go. And them say no, me can't fence up the beach. 
Now we get in trouble if we find something beach, so I have to leave it. Smith says he has always warned users off the beach to be more careful, but they refuse to comply. Why government must tell we say them free to come and bail? Me can't resent nobody for come on the beach. Cause I will have stopped them. I try to stop them two times. Me have me not even the letter for show you where them want me. And say if I fence around the beach and fence I'll beach, I'll be in trouble. The search continues for Ramon Hall. Khadija Thomas, CVM Live. The case now of a St. Catherine mother whose desperation to find her son, who has been reported missing after he visited the police station on, as a condition of his bail over a week now. Last week, she stumbled upon what she thought was enough evidence to convince herself he was killed and buried. However, as Curlin Brown reports, that discovery now has the police in St. Catherine North seeking the public's assistance in identifying bodies. With no certainty, the missing man is among the dead. So I would like to know what the reason them do my child that way. Hey, what do you reason to my child that way? Leonora Vassal, also known as Sandra, poured out her heart to her correspondent on Friday, certain that she had finally found her son. Although dead, she could now begin the slow path to some closure. Along with others, she had been searching for him for four days. From Nago report in do not return back. As part of bail arrangements for what his mother said was a case of self-defense, the man said to be of an unsound mind was ordered to show up twice at the Spanish Town Police Station. He lick him and, 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 and he stab him inside and he lock him up. But it, it is self-defense because every time he always I beat him. Ms. Vassa says on Tuesday the police promised to help in the search, but that didn't happen. And what they found on Friday was her boy. We, we, we go down there and we make a search. We, we see finds the slippers, the underpants, and the bag strap. We see it, and we see blood, and they like, show some, some gas L on it. And then... We go back over to the other side. We see we, we, we look at the trap like like weird. Then go over to the passive and go over. See it? And then we go over there. As we go, not even not even families, don't it? We see where the, the, the grave the grave is. A fuck was there and and and, and, and a rag was there. But the police say there was no physical body until when the area along Marchpen Road was dug up on Saturday. Then, in a sudden twist, what the police unearthed was not one, but two unidentified bodies, one decomposed and the other in a state of decomposition. The saga continued on Monday as another alarm was raised. A third body was found covered up by dirt and other debris in bushes along the Dunbeholding main road. The next step now is to ascertain the identities of all three bodies. An unusual sight in Portland as an individual locked the gates of the Transport Authority, claiming that they were occupying the land illegally. CVM Live's Joel Crosskill reports. Operations at the Transport Authority Portland Satellite Office were disrupted by an individual who padlocked the facility's gates, locking its occupants inside. The reason behind his actions, as claimed by him, is that he is the rightful owner of the property being occupied by the Transport Authority. My place this! Birchall Melbourne place this! Transfer from Stamason is to Birchall Melbourne and Fimi place this! And I beg me, I beg this, the Court of Appeals said this is Fimi! Go inside, stay inside! Uno call all, uno one call. The commissioner of police. Me have been letter here. Call him. He says that the transport authority has occupied his premises for the past four years without paying rent. Call Mike Henry. Call the minister for contract to me. Uno pa man place for four years. Uno me me can no uno me can lock the gate already. Uno beat me up. Can me go to court? Me win uno. Me can no for rent. Uno come out of my place. Uno has squatters. Uno has trespass for my land. Uno take people for idiot. My place. Describing them as squatters, Mr. Melbourne continued his harangue against Minister Henry and the Transport Authority. He then turned his attention to the security guard that was stationed at the gate. 
This is the your face, security boy. I go tell me, say, you, 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 you don't entitled to be here. You don't entitled to be on my land. Go lock me. You're not supposed to. Well, you lock me out and me lock you in. Who are the bigger boss? Me. Attempts to contact the communications office of the transport authority prove futile. Joel Crossgill, CVM Live. UKIS, which represents some 26 workers at the Trinidad conglomerate owned Berger Paints Jamaica Limited, will be seeking mediation at the Ministry of Labor to settle a wage adjustment ahead of today's strike action. We have more. It wasn't a picture perfect color outside the Berger Paints Jamaica Spanish Town Road offices. Rather than putting together paint solutions, clerical, technical, and supervisory staff members were on Tuesday morning on work stoppage. Alongside them was President of the Union for Clerical Administrative and Supervisory Employees, UK's Vincent Morrison. Ironically, at the center of the dispute, he says, is not the company's inability to pay. The company has made profits in excess of 172 percent over the last year. Claims were served in January 2017 ahead of the last contract, which ended in March that year. And so the decision after dialogue not to give workers a fair and a decent wage adjustment is major. This was three years ago, an 18 percent adjustment was made to the workers. that the company has made, one, two, with the cost of living, the rise in the cost of living over the past three years, and with the fact that the company has reduced the workforce for this value from 45 down to about 26. We believe that when you put those factors together, the position is unreasonable. Mr. Morrison scoffs at the explanation that the super profits made went elsewhere. As you are aware, Hansa McCall, a company out of Trinidad and Tobago, took over the company, ownership of the company, in about July last year. And what they are saying, they can't pay because they didn't, those profits that we alluded to, they didn't make those profits, they didn't get those profits. That is not our, our business. Consultation will be had with the Ministry of Labor on Wednesday to determine the way forward. A plan to prevent the nation's youth from adopting a life of criminality as members of one of the nation's numerous gangs was laid out by ACP Steve McGregor, who touted a six-pillar plan to curb the gang's recruitment of impressionable youth. CVM Live Joel Crosskill reports. Head of the Community Safety and Security Branch, ACP Steve McGregor, at a recent meeting of the Rotary Club, stated his six-pillar plan to curtail criminality from the nation's youth. There are six pillars that will drive a community becoming safe. And four of them are geared at our young people. Because our young people make up the bulk of those who are being killed. And equally, they make up the bulk of those who are doing the killing. So anything that we're going to devise to manage crime and violence in our country, most of it must be focused on our young people. The first pillar revolves around a curfew that has been implemented to prevent recruitment of youth in certain communities from being inducted into gangs. The reason for the curfew program is that our young people are making up the biggest part of recruiting program for gang members. Our, gang, our gangs in our communities are recruiting these young people because they are young, agile, and can run around and go through the small spaces to commit robberies. They are also recruiting them because they have not yet made the police block, mean we don't have any data on them, so we play catch up when they commit crime. Other pillars of the plan include the safe school program, whereby police officers liaise with school security officers to promote peace. The youth club program to give youngsters an alternative to hanging out with gangs. The mentorship program, we make the mistake all the time to think that the parents that we have are good enough to parent this generation of children. It's not working. 
have always said that this generation of parents are the worst ever, and it is proven to be so. The fifth pillar requires the involvement of the community at large, with the formation of a consultative committee. The final pillar is represented by a neighborhood watch to build resilience against incursions from gangs into vulnerable communities. Joel Crosskill, CVM Live. With the enhanced security measures still in effect in St. James, students at the UTEC Western Campus have become more fearful for their own safety and security. CVM Live's Khadija Thomas has this report. When gun violence had flared up in the parish last year, evening classes were suspended at the Western Campus as students were advised to take steps to ensure their personal safety. Fast forward to the present, the enhanced security measure is still affecting students whose movements have been hampered by the crime fighting strategy. The challenge really for them is getting taxis in the evening because we have evening classes and evening classes start at 6 p.m. and they go up until 9 p.m. And the students have complained that when they leave classes at 9 p.m., even at 8 p.m., they're having a challenge getting taxis to go home. The UTEC Western Campus Coordinator, Sophia McIntosh, says this has led to students being hesitant to attend classes, but the university has implemented a shuttle bus system for their safety. We take the students to a central point, and that is uh, downtown Montego Bay. That is in Stamshop Square. So, and we, we encourage the students and our lecturers also to be safe and to ask our lecturers to use, use their judgment. McIntosh adds that most of these students are from inner city communities and have conveyed grave concerns about the violence within the parish. But she hopes this will not deter them from their classes. Some have expressed that they probably would feel comfortable you know, going, to, going, to, going to Kingston instead of staying in Montego Bay or young people. And um, it's sad and I'm hoping that it doesn't impact them. Khadija Thomas, CVM Live. The Governor General Sir Patrick Allen and Lady Allen were the guests of honor at a ceremony to celebrate the 160th anniversary of the Hampton School in Malvern, St. Elizabeth. It's just it's amazing that a school could have survived with such excellence for 160 years. It's amazing. It's a tribute to the board, the teachers, the parents, everyone. Who have, who have supported the school to this extent. Uh, it is very clear that learning is at its height here in Hampton. Deandra Sutherland, the head girl, explained what accounted for the longevity and, longevity and success of the institution. This year, Hampton School is celebrating 160 years. So far, we've had our launch in February. Today, we had a ceremony which we, we invited the Governor General and his team. Hampton School continues to produce leaders of the finest ilk. We have an immense, diverse population of ladies. We are a boarding institution, and as such, our ladies are very independent and reliable. Roseanne Lones, the acting headmistress, celebrated the attendance of the Governor General for this auspicious occasion. Hampton is very proud, you know, that we can acknowledge our great achievements over the years. And, you know, today is a significant day in our history. So we were very happy to have the Governor General and Lady Allen here, as well as a few well-wishers sharing in our 160th celebration. Time now for a look at the regional and international news. In Trinidad and Tobago, five families from Bamboo Village, Cedros, had to be evacuated yesterday evening after massive coastal erosion caused the house to fall into the sea. Three homes belonging to other residents were also on the brink of collapse. About 400 meters of the Bamboo Village Extension Road collapsed into the Columbus Bay during yesterday's incident. Electricity poles were also torn down, rendering the village without power and throwing them into darkness at nightfall, and water lines were also dislodged. In Belize, eight lawmen are behind bars on charges of murder and attempted murder. Seven are members of the Belize Special Assignment Group, and the other is assigned to the elite unit. The men were jointly charged over the weekend and arraigned on Monday for the deadly attack that happened inside a home in Orange Walk Town. It is believed that the group entered the house and allegedly accosted four men, brutally beating and killing one, and seriously injuring another. And in news on the international scene, 
U.S. President Donald Trump has picked one of his political strategists as campaign manager for his 2020 re-election campaign. The Trump Organization hired Brad Parscale in 2011 as a digital guru. There's no time like the president in politics, number one. Number two, this president is looking at a very grim, or at least potentially grim, midterm 2018 cycle. And he knows a lot of Republicans, certainly in the House, and there are anxieties now creeping into the Senate Republican cloakroom as well, that this could be a very tough year for Republicans. They could possibly lose control of the House, not expand their majority, possibly lose it in the Senate. And that would basically leave this president with just himself as the head of the Republican Party and no longer... Republican majorities in the House or Senate if things really tilt toward the Democrats. So he's got to build a machinery for his re-election campaign in 2020 and start focusing on that. Now, I will tell you, there are plenty of congressional Republicans who look at that idea and say, well, these don't really match. Mr. President, what you need to do is focus on 2018. You need to help down-ballot Republicans running for re-election in the House and the Senate. Don't worry about your re-election worry about our re-election, because without us, you don't have a congressional Republican majority. So there will be those who will look at this 2020 campaign announcement and the building out of this team and say, Mr. President, your priorities are a little on the indulgent side. What we need you to do is focus money, effort, politics on the 2018 midterms, not 2020 re-election. Those were the top regional and international stories this evening. I'm Nikoi Wilson. Well, those were our major stories. News Live in 5 will come your way later on in the program. But up next is our panel discussion. And we look at the role of women in the church. And should they be allowed to, to assume positions of leadership? When we return, we'll hear from our pastor.